Okay, so thank you for staying this long and thanks to all the organizers for having me on this uh, really interesting event. So I'll be talking about clustering in networks, phase transitions and optimal algorithms. It's a work that I have done with a number of people, collaborators and students. The, one of them, Florent, whom you probably heard this, uh, this morning. So to put what I want to talk about in the framework of this workshop is not very difficult because it is really well set in the framework of this conference. So we all are interested in finding useful information in data. Right? That's why we are here and that's why we are discussing. Because if we understand structure of data, we can hope to predict, classify, understand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the usual like machine learning equation could be written that we have some model. Then we need to think of some model. Uh, sorry, we have some data. We need to think for some of some model. And now if we fit the data, the model on the data, we can hope to do some prediction. So the job you know, of the algorithm and of us to understand the procedure is this fitting the model on the data. So I will be talking about that for one particular case, and that's this one, so the clustering of networks. So my data will be network, set of nodes with connection, connections in the same spirit as we heard in a number of talks, yes, mainly yesterday and today. And the model is also a model that has been already mentioned in a couple of talks, this stochastic block model. So I believe that the nodes belong to groups and that the probability that two nodes connect is kind of random. It depends only on which group the nodes belonged to. Okay, so to define it, so once again, so what is the problem? So I have a network, it's, you know, I see the nodes non-labeled, but I assume that behind that there were some, that in the world that created the network, there were some labels of the nodes, and I'm given the graph, and I want to dif divide the nodes into groups in such a way that nodes in one group somehow play the same role in the network, that they connect in the same way to the other groups. So this is, you know, informally. So you can imagine, I don't know, in a, in a coffee break, uh, that I would be given a network of who talked to who. And from that, I would be supposed to infer what are the different fields represented in this, uh, in this group. So of course, there is a lot of noise, right? People might talk to each other because they are friends from college, not because they work in the same field. And some people in the same field, I don't know, they like found the same solution to the same problem. One of them published it first, so they don't talk to each other anymore. So I will never see a connection between those. So there is a lot of noise. So this is just fun example of what I'm trying to do. So to be a bit more formal about what is my model, so is the stochastic block model that we heard about today and also yesterday in Andrea Montanari's talk. So I have Q groups on N nodes. So these I will be, you know, in the whole talk I will be using Q for the number of groups and N for the size of the network. And then I divide, so the generative process takes these N nodes, divides them into groups. So this would be the sizes of the subgroups. A is the index of the group and A runs from one to Q. And then I have this little Q by Q matrix of probabilities, P, A, B that if I pick two nodes and one of them is in group A and the other is in group B, then PAB is the probability to connect. Okay? Now if PAB was just a constant, this would be the Erdős-Rényi graph and PAB will be a generic matrix. And here is a little example. So note, you know, note those who were yesterday on Andreas' talk, he was talking about the case where you have two groups of equal size and this PAB matrix was just A on the diagonal and B out of diagonal. Okay, so this is the model, and you know, the goal is, so this model generates the network, and then I hide the labels of the nodes, I only present you the adjacency matrix, permute it in some arbitrary way, and your goal is to infer which, group, which node was in which group. So obviously in any, you know, real data that we will collect, 
the network that we collect is not generated by this model, right? So, okay. So then we could, you know, do a lot of research on how bad or good that is. But, you know, in the point of view of mathematical sciences or understanding really what are our problems and what can we hope to achieve statistically, algorithmically, etc., it might be a good idea to first study the networks that are exactly generated by this model and see what's happening on those, okay? And at least understand well this, and then once we understand this well, we can add the baggage of the fact that the data are moreover not generated exactly by this model. And that's what uh, my talk today will be about. So I will be only talking, so I will have some real networks examples at the end, but all the like uh, claims and, and results will be about networks that were generated by this stochastic block model. And so what, when, what you know, what gets, so, so I told you about the model, I told you about the doing optimally inference, so any of you, you know, who knows about inference or you go to page 30 of any good, like, uh, in, uh, statistics uh, textbook, you know how to solve this problem. If you have a infinite computational power, what you should do, so this is, you know, partly to introduce them, uh, what you should do, but also to introduce the notation. So the membership of nodes to groups will be called SI, so SI takes value you know, from one to Q, and I is the index of the node. A, I, J is the adjacency matrix, so one if connected, zero if not connected. And all the information about who is in which group is contained in the posterior measure distribution, which is a normalization times the way I divided the, the nodes into groups and you know the way I define the model, this this is this is the distribution of what the labels were in the first place before I generated the graph. And then once I had the labels, the probability that I generated a given graph is just what I told you. I put the edge with probability p, and I don't put the edge with probability one minus p. And I have a product here because I do it independently at random for every possible pair of edges. All right, so I put, I use the Bayes formula and put these together and this is, and now if I am to, so, you know, I want to do the best inference, so what does the best mean? I want to, for instance, max, so it's a, you know, reasonable measure to want to maximize the number of nodes that are correctly assigned, right? That's a nice, nice thing we might want to do. So you can prove on two lines that in order to get an estimator that maximizes the number of correctly assigned nodes, you need to compute the marginals of this posterior pro pro probability distribution, and this is how marginals are defined, right? It's the sum of this over everybody except uh, one of the nodes. And then I just take mean, th sorry, then the best estimate is just the value for which this marginal is the biggest. It's a marginal on Q disk, you know, it's, I have Q discrete values. So this is what I need to do. So if we didn't have any computational issue, my talk would stop here. We could go home. This is what we need to do. Except that this takes time in general exponentially and N to do. So it's not uh, computationally tractable. So we are going back to, okay, statistically, this problem is easy. Computationally, it's a priori not easy. So what do we do? So when we talk about Bayesian inference, you know, there are basically, you know, basic things that come to our mind, like first of the things that come to our mind is Gibbs sampling, Monte Carlo. So we had two really nice talks on, uh, on Monday, which were basically saying, you know, on big data, Monte Carlo is thought of notoriously slow, you know, it takes a long time to converge. It's a really interesting line of research to try to speed it up and use some properties of the database. And I could also do Monte Carlo on this problem. But what else could I do? Could I do something faster? So some other thing that I could do is variational, variational bias. or In physics, we call it mean field method, variational mean field. So you also saw an example of that in the talk of Florent for the compressing problem. So that's sometimes a good method, but it can be also very wrong, and it's not very easy to analyze when it is, you know, when it is good or when it is bad, when we are close to the boundary where things are barely statistically possible. So there is a third method, and that's this uh, 
belief propagation or beta approximation in physics or in general like message passing in, uh, in, uh, in computer science. And this is what I will you know, advocate at least in the first, uh, in the next at least 10 minutes. So this at one hand is a nice algorithm to solve this problem. But what I like about it even most, it gives it, at the same time it provides me, is it's a nice analysis tool. I will be looking on the, so this is what I will use. And you know, here this is just a repetition, Flora already said it, you know, every useful tool has been independently rediscovered in several fields. So if that's not the case, then this is probably not a useful tool or maybe a very new tool. So this is one of them and it's an algorithm and analysis tool. So what's nice about it is that I can use it to analyze what will be happening in my model in this limit, so the thermodynamic limit in physics. So I take very large graphs and I take fixed number of groups and for my analysis to work, I kind of need it. Yeah, I don't know, this is an interesting open problem, how to have my kind of results when the number of groups is growing with the size of the network. So I will have a number of groups that is fixed and every of the group is taking a finite fraction of the network. So these big NA divided by N is some little NA that is of order one. And the interesting case I will be looking at will be sparse graphs when this probability of connection scales like a constant over N so one argument is that many of the real networks are sparse, but more, you know, mathematically appealing argument is this is the scaling in which the interesting things happen. If you have dense graphs and this is true, then the inference problem is easy. So here you will have the, you know, the transitions between what is impossible statistically, what is hard algorithmically, what is easy algorithmically. So that's the interesting limit we will be looking at. And once I said that, I can tell you, know, what is this propagation, belief propagation doing? So here I rewrite this, this um, normalization of my posterior probability. And this can be represented by a graphical model or a factor graph. It's a fully connected graphical model where you know, the variables are the nodes of the graph and you know, their values are to which group do they belong and the factors are on edges, you know, these, these probabilities. So when we th think about belief propagation and about when it is good, so we somehow know this, always good on trees. And in, when, when the graphical model is not tree, we, you know, it's very hard to prove something in general about uh, belief propagation being a good algorithm. But at least we have this intuition that on tree-like graphs, it's also good. So this is not even tree-like, this is fully connected. But notice that since we are working in the limit where the P scales like one over N, that on the non-edges, this is a very weak contribution. It's almost one. So this is a model which is kind of a, where the mean field approximation, the variational Gibbs would be exact on the non-edges and where we only need this belief propagation for the edges and the edges are tree-like because this stochastic bulk model is basically generating something that locally looks like an erdos schrodinger graph. Okay, so we use that. So we rewrite a little bit the belief propagation, the canonical belief propagation for that model and that's what we end up with. So this is the algorithm. So, the al so, so this looks a little bit complicated, but it's not so complicated. You know, here you have these N and C, which are the parameters for the, of the model. So I didn't, have, I didn't say it, but should have, that in this part of the talk, I assume that you know, the, the, the teacher that gave me that problem was nice to me, and he also gave me the values of these parameters. I will tell you in two slides how to learn them if that was not the case. But for the moment, let's say that I know the exact values of these parameters. So there's the C here. So the H is defined here, and the sums are either over the you know, Q possible labels or over nodes that are connected to a given node up to something. So the only thing in these equations that, you know, that are the things that you are iterating, the messages, are these psi's. And it's a, you know, they have, for a mathematician, probably far too many indices. So these two indices, these upper indices, that's just to say these are messages. They are running on the edges. 
So on every edge, you have a message in one direction and message in another direction. So that's one thing. And there are Q component vectors. You know, they have Q components according to the value of this S. So this is what you need to you know, code in your MATLAB or Julia or whatever. You need to iterate these equations. But this is not you know, such a big deal. You can do it if you are a bit clever about some some key, bookkeeping, you can do this uh, in time that is linear in the size of the network, linear in the average degree, and quadratic in the number of groups. So this is quite good. You can go to like tens of millions nodes, and it's not a big deal. So that's the like, it's, it's computationally tractable. And it also has this beautiful asymptotic property that when you estimate the marginals from the belief propagation and when you compare them to the exact, you know, bias optimal marginals that somebody gave to you because he had exponentially long time or exponentially many PhD students that could have computed it for him, then the BP marginals in the limit of large n and finite number of groups and sparse graphs are actually equal to the true ones up to some factor that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So this is nice. So you use that. And now I, you know, now the thing is you can compute the marginals, but you can also use the fixed point of the equations on the previous slide to compute the beta estimate of this normalization of your posterior. So that's the likelihood. And you know that if you want to learn parameters or test hypotheses, that's the likelihood that is useful in Bayesian inference. So for instance, to learn the parameters, you have this normalization, this partition function in physics is a function of your, bar of your parameters. And to learn the, the most probable value of your parameters given the data, you just need to maximize this partition function. And if you write, you know, what is the derivative of this function and you iteratively update this, you end up with equations that when you look at them, it's expectation maximization. It's telling you, for instance, you know, the sum of my marginals, the sum of probabilities that node i is in group A should be equal to the fraction the group A is taking. And if it is not true, then you better update your parameter because this is what it should be if you are having, if you were having the right value of parameters. So, okay, and so you are looking for a maximum of a function that depends on a finite number of parameters. So this is computationally not a issue. Well, in practice, it is actually an issue, but it's not adding an, any exponential in n factor to your complexity. I will get back to it. So, fine. So, so as an algorithm, it is clear. You have your graph. You run this uh, uh, you know, uh, belief propagation. You have your marginals. You compute your estimator. You can do things. Now, how do you use this? I said, you know, it's, also, it's an algorithm on one side, and on the other side, it's a nice analysis tool for this large n limit. So how do you analyze this large end limit? So you do, you know, it's, you don't do much. You do one thing, which is you cheat a little bit. You assume, you know, you compare, you allow yourself to use the true labels, okay, of the nodes for the purpose of the analysis. Of course, the algorithm is not using it. And then you run the algorithm. So you do two different runs of the algorithm on your graph. One is when you initialize your messages at random, so you just put some, you know, it's, it's a normalized vector, so, but you can use the, choose the components randomly and then iterate and you see where it goes. And the other normalization, I call it planted, that you actually initialize the values of these messages in the, you know, either it's zero if the component doesn't correspond to your original group assignment, or it is one if the component corresponds to your original group assignment. So this, of course, you can do only if you yourself generated the graph and you know what is the ground truth. But for the purpose of the analysis of what's happening and what the bias optimal inference would be doing, you, could, you can do this. And you iterate these two. So either it happens that from these two initializations you find exactly the same fixed point, then that's the right fixed point. That's the one that is giving you the bias optimal marginals. Or there are different fixed points. In that case, the one that is giving you the bias optimal marginals is the one that has a bigger beta likelihood or smaller beta free energy if you put the minus sign. Okay, so that's the recipe. That's the recipe. And we have like rather, you know, complete and deep theoretical physics arguments that this recipe is correct 
but no rigorous proof yet. I mean, we don't have a rigorous proof that for this specific model, the better likelihood is actually the, um, the, bias of the, the bias likelihood, and that the marginals are actually the bias optimal marginals. But it is true. It's just we don't have the proof yet in this limit. All right, so now, so now I told you what to do, so let's do it. So here is an example. So here I generated the graph with four groups and average degree 16. And it was one of these like assortative structures. If you are in the same group, you are more likely connected. If you're in different group, you are less likely connected. So this, this C out over N was the probability that you are connected if you are in the same group and C in if you are not in the same group and C in over N the probability that you are connected if you are in the same group. And here, so here if this x-axis is one, what you did, you have just a random Erdős-Rényi graph. Like the probability doesn't depend if you were or not in the same group. And if it is zero, you just created four separated subgraphs. So there it should be easy to detect who was where. So, but, so now you see, and okay, the y-axis is some kind of uh, performance. If it is one, you perfectly recovered everybody. And if it is zero, you just did as bad as you would do if you just randomly chose for everybody without knowing any graph whatsoever. So naively, you know, without being a physicist and without knowing anything about phase transitions, I think that everybody would reasonably expect a curve that goes from one to zero smoothly like this. And you see that's not what is happening. Here, even if this epsilon is half, that means that I am twice as likely to connect to somebody in my group, so say that Mike is in my group, and I, you know, I don't know you, so you're not in my group, so I'm twice as likely to connect to him than to you, and I create a huge graph with average number of friends 16, which is reasonable number of average friends. There won't be any information in the graph whatsoever about who was in which group. And that really in the sense that I won't be able to distinguish that graph from a random erdos any random graph. And you know, mathematically, the, the, you know, it's not exactly the same ensemble in terms of the total variational distance. But it, it, you know, people call it, it's a contiguous ensemble. Like if I generate one graph from one and measure something on it, I cannot distinguish from erdos any random graph. So this is, this is interesting that we have this region where even though in the real world there were communities, strong, rather strong ones, it, the inference problem is not possible to solve, information theoretically, whatsoever you do, because here we are doing the information theoretic thing. And then there is this threshold starting from which you are getting, you are getting some nice overlap. And now this threshold, I call it a weak. It, it is a phase transition, and I, you know, in physics we call phase transition something that is related to thermodynamical limit when the system is really large, and also it's, it's, um, you know, it must be related to either what we would call critical slowing down, which in this case translates, if you look at the convergence time at the algorithm, or you could equivalently look at the equilibration time of the corresponding Monte Carlo, which here you, you could do. It would not be that slow. I mean, for this size of graphs, you could do it. You would see that the equilibration time diverges around that phase transition. So this critical slowing down is necessary. You know, if you, sometimes people just have some curve that is dropping down and call it a phase transition. So not every drop down is a phase transition in physics. To have a phase transition, you need a thermodynamic limit and critical slowing down in case of a continuous second order, this is just a name, phase transition, or some metastability in case of a first order phase transition. I will, I will come to, the, to this. So this is what's happening here. And how do we locate this phase transition here? So, you know, BP is a good analysis tool, so that's what we do. So we realized that in that undetectable regime where we couldn't say anything, there was actually, it was because the, the, the associated fixed point of the belief propagation was just this. It was just telling us that a node, the, the probability for every node to be in every group is just the prior information. There is not more information than what the, you know, what the original group sizes were telling me. And this is a fixed point. And now I can, you know, and when I 
bump into the phase transition, I start to find a different fixed point. So what I can do is really simple. I just take this fixed point and, and I do linear stability analysis of this fixed point. So I have these iterative equations. I compute derivative of my message to, with respect to the incoming message. This gives me some little matrix. And as I would do in dynamical systems, I just take the leading eigenvalue of that little matrix. And when it's square times the average degree is bigger than, is smaller than one, then I am, you know, in the regime, in the undetectable regime, and when it is bigger than one, then I'm in the detectable regime. So this is a really easy way to compute the phase transition. And if you evaluate it for this special case of the stochastic block model where the probabilities to be connected is one number and probabilities not to be, to be connected if you are in the same group is one number and if you are not in the same group is another number, this C in and C out, you are getting a really nice expression for the phase transition. And that's the same expression that appeared in Andrea Stock. He was having this A minus B divided by A plus B. So A plus B is just the average degree. A plus B divided by two. Is, so this is, this is generalization of his formula to the, to the generic uh, Q uh, state uh, stochastic block model. All right, so you have this phase transition, really easy to, to, com you know, to compute from our, from our tools. But the way we did it was not rigorous, but now this is, for, for two groups, this is now a fully rigorous statement that below the phase transition, these graphs are congruent to our Deschwenny random graphs, and above the phase transition, there are algorithms that get a positive correlation to the actual group assignment. And the detectable side is also proven for, not only for two groups. The undetectable side is tricky for more than two groups, and you will understand right away why. So what happens, you know, second order phase transition, first order, so, okay, what happens? So another example. So before I had four groups, average degree 16, and the groups were assortative. Being in the same group, we were more likely friends. Now it's the other way around. Now I have five groups, and now if we are in the same groups, we are never connected, just never ever. So now I only can connect to people that I don't know, people that are in the my group, I just don't connect to them, whatever, I don't know, we are competing for promotion, so I don't talk to you anymore, or something like that. So this, you realize that it's a kind of, if you know about coloring problem, graph coloring problem, it's a planted coloring problem. Like planted coloring is a special case of this stochastic block model. So now again, I do my, my game with the belief propagation algorithm with the two different initializations. Now I have a regime of parameters, and this is just the average degree. Now I have a regime of parameters where the two initializations do not yield the same fixed point. So what's happening here? I told you the one I should take is the one with, bet, with the larger likelihood. So let me, in this figure, you know, I also have the difference of the likelihood. So you see that moreover, there is some third point in the middle where the likelihood crosses. And so what's happening here, actually, this is a first order phase transition. So we like to sketch it as a, you know, one would have somehow the likelihood function as a, as a function of this, like how good am I doing? And the algorithm is always starting at zero here because at the beginning it doesn't do anything. This Q is like the overlap with the actual assignment. So at the beginning I don't know anything about the actual assignment, so I start here. And I'm going down in the function. And either I am stuck at a local, at a local uh, optima or not. And this is, you know, and the, the two and the two positions of the two local optima would, uh, would correspond to my two fixed points. So this is what is happening here. So if I go back to this picture, so this picture is a picture of a first order phase transition in physics. So that would be really the phase transition between, you know, when, when water freezes. So what, you know, so this regime would be the liquid, this would be the ice, this would be the first, uh, the phase transition itself, and this, in, in, and this region around the phase transition where I have these two different fixed points, that would be the metastability. If you were at Florence stock, there's the super cooled liquid. So there's the liquid at minus five degrees Celsius or the ice at plus, uh, I don't know, two degrees Celsius. Okay. So now you see in physics, these are not really so, in physics, physics lives in finite dimension embedded in finite dimensional Euclidean space and nucleation always happens. That's the little experiment that Flournoy was doing. 
in these graphs that cannot be embedded in finite dimensional Euclidean space, these, this metastability means that you know, either something is exponential in the size of the system uh, or you don't know what to do. So, so that's what it is and we somehow, you know, so this, so what is happening now algorithmically? So it's undetectable information theoretically for degree, you know, the larger degree, the more information you have here up to this CC transition. But in this region up to this CS, so the spinodal transition, we don't know what to do algorithmically. This algorithm doesn't work. Monte Carlo wouldn't work. We actually believe that nothing would work. So that's the next slide. And starting from the spinodal, the VD propagation is working. Monte Carlo would be working. So that's the easy phase. This is the possible but hard phase. So, you know, now there is the usual story. Like this is a, you know, boundary for the belief propagation for the algorithm you are analyzing. Fine, so maybe another algorithm can do better. And that's, you know, that's, I would like to claim here that no. And it's in the same <coughs> class of problems as, you know, the planted click problem that Andrea was talking about. And, you know, likely the tensor factorization that, uh, the, or completion of factorization as well, that we also heard about today. And so what could we say about this, uh, this phase transition? So physically, this algorithmic barrier is a spinodal line of a first order phase transition. And it has like profound physical meanings in, uh, in, in condensed matter theory. And it's an algorithmic barrier, the same origin. If you analyze the bias optimal algorithms, you find a spinodal of a first order phase transition in many problems, including the compression sync, error correcting codes, planted constraint satisfaction problems, sparse PCA, matrix factorization, planted click tensor completion. Okay, I repeat myself here. Yeah, M many you know, interesting problems. And the conjecture is that it's really a barrier for very large class of algorithms, certainly including message passing, GIF sampling, some local searches, spectral algorithms. And Andrea was arguing also the semi-definite uh, hierarchy. And it's interesting that there is, a, I know of one algorithm that doesn't belong to this class that is stopped by this spin oil transition, and that's the Gauss elimination. If you look at the XOR sat constraint satisfaction problem, she, okay, it's not really the topic of this talk, so if you don't know what it is, ignore it. But if you know what it is, in XOR sat, which is just a linear problem, you can find solutions with Gaussian elimination, yet from the perspective of, uh, of you know, my story of phase transitions and what the bias optimal inference and belief propagation would do, it just looks the same as what I am telling you here. So what is making, you know, so Gaussian elimination is very special. It's using the linear symmetry of the problem and, and the other problems don't have such symmetries as far as we know. So, so it's not all polynomial algorithms that are stopped by this uh, but we beat a really large class and I think it's a really great problem to characterize this class and say something more about this phase transition. So back to algorithms. So, so far I was advocating this belief propagation is really great algorithm. Well, I keep, you know, it's still true that it's the best analysis tool we know for this problem in terms of how sharp we can get the, the phase transition in this, you know, extremely sparse regime. But as an algorithm, it's not that great because it's quadratic in the number of groups. So, you know, in some real networks, you would have very many groups. If every high school class is a community, then, you know, being quadratic in the number of high school classes in the US is maybe not so good. And it needs to know the parameters or learn them. So it's not adding an exponential factor in N yeah, but it, that's true. But still, if you have 20 groups and you need to explore the space of parameters and this expectation maximization learning has a lot of local minima and you have to rerun it many times to find the best one, it's, it's, it's a bottleneck of the algorithm. And it's, always, it's also relying on this tree-like approximation. You know, it's asymptotically exact for the stochastic block model. But as soon as I try it on a graph that is not generated by the stochastic block model, somebody in the audience will jump at me and say, there were small loops in your graph and you are using belief propagation here so I don't believe what you are telling me. And he would not be that, you know, wrong. It's a valid argument. So could we do some method that doesn't have these bottlenecks? 
And also, you know, we also heard a number of times mentioned, like, when you think about clustering, you think about spectral clustering. Okay, so in few lines, what is spectral clustering? So I take the matrix, the adjacency matrix of my network, typically, fine, uh -huh. I do the eigenvalue decomposition, I take the second largest eigenvalue of that uh, matrix and the associated eigenvector. And if the eigenvector elements are positive, I put the nodes on one side. If they are negative, I put the no nodes on the other side. And this is a really good clustering algorithm. Why? Well, when you think about the random walker on the graph, then the second eigenvalue of the random walks is somehow telling me where will I be blocked for a long time. It's clear that if I have two loosely connected groups that I will stay in one and then I will jump rarely to the other, etc. So, so there's somehow the intuition. You don't have to do it with the adjacency matrix. Usually people would use the Laplacian or the Laplacian normalized in different ways or the random walk matrix or the modularity matrix and there are a number of matrices that, the, that you know, every, every one of these matrices gives a little bit different performance. But each of them is very reasonable when the graph is sufficiently dense. But here is something that already Andrea said yesterday, that in this limit of sparse graphs that I am looking at, it's actually not such a good idea to do these spectral methods. Why? Because imagine for the adjacency matrix, you will have some high degree node, and that high degree node will actually induce a eigenvalue that is just square root of its degree, and degrees of nodes in Erdős Rényi random graphs can be as high as log n divided by something or so. So square root of log n, if n is really big, is much bigger than, you know, n is very big. So this property somehow creating these Lifshitz tails in your spectra of a graph and this is, you know, and then the eigenvalue that is telling you about the clusters is somehow hiding inside. So this is not so good in this extremely sparse regime. And here is like the same thing said algorithmically. So here, you know, back to the stochastic block model, this is again the overlap, the performance, the bigger, the better. Here, it's, you know, how different are these probabilities to be connected inside a group or outside a group? This is the phase transition. This little formula is somewhere here. And now these lines that you can't really distinguish here, there's the performance of the, of the classical spectral methods based on random walk, adjacency matrix, symmetrized Laplacian, the modularity matrix. They, event, you know, when it is almost disconnected, they are good, but they are not, you know, here they go to, to zero performance uh, quite fast. The black line is the result of the belief propagation. So I hope I persuaded you the belief propagation and the bias optimal is the same. So nothing in the world can do better than the, bias, than the belief propagation in this case. And then the blue line is a spectral method that I will tell you about. Based on a matrix B, which is defined how, which we call the non-backtracking matrix. And what is this? So it's a kind of adjacency of directed edges, right? So, this, so if you have n nodes and m edges, this matrix is 2m times 2m, and there is one if, you know, this would be, the indexes would be these directed edges, so i to j is directed edge, and the index would be one if j is equal to k and a is not equal to l, and zero otherwise. So another way you can think about this matrix, like you write the simplest possible message passing you can think about, and that is, that is defining this non-backtracking matrix. Right? You are going, you're following your um, directed edges, but you're never going back. That's why non-backtracking, that's in the definition. So this is sometimes called it math, in math literature Hashimoto edge adjacency operator or matrix. It's used in a number of papers. I listed here some for as, a, as a analysis tools. Like when you want to prove something, I don't know, mixing times of non-backtracking random walks. I mean, this is really useful thing to do. But before our paper, it was never used like as a basis for an algorithm. So let's do it. Let's take this matrix and let's compute its spectra and take the corresponding eigenvector and do spectral clustering with it. So that's what we do. And how is it, you know, how, how did we even came up with that? And how is it connected to my belief propagation and all that? Well, you actually saw this matrix already. I was on one slide, I was telling you how I compute the phase transition position. 
So maybe you skipped that slide because it seemed a bit technical, okay, but, he, but I gave it there for a reason because now if I come back to this computation of the linearization of the belief propagation around its trivial fixed point, in this linearization, the matrix that will pop out is exactly this non-backtracking matrix tensored with a little Q by Q matrix, which, okay, the, the, you know, the spectrum will be dominated. What will matter here is the, is the leading eigenvalue of the non-backtracking matrix. So this is where it comes from. And now, now I can show you its properties. So notice it's a non-symmetric matrix, right? It's not symmetric, so its spectra will be complex. And it looks like this. So this is a complex plane. So this is, you know, every point here is an eigenvalue. So this is graph of, uh, I think, 1,000 nodes. So I have 1,000 point he points here. And you see that they are all in a circle. And the circle has a radius, the square root of the average degree. And when I say all, it's really that in the thermodynamic limit, there would be you know, except the few that I will describe, there will be no eigenvalue out of the circle. So this, is, and this is in the sparse graph case. So you see from a spectral theory of sparse random graphs, this is very partic particular. Because I bet that, unless you heard about this matrix, all the matrices you heard about have these Lifshitz tails on, that means eigenvalues that are really, really large when the size of the graph is large on sparse graphs, not this one. So this is what makes it special and you know, so nice for, for things where you need a spectral gap to find some information that was hidden in the structure of the graph. And then there is one eigenvalue, which is just, just the average degree, so that one you can understand it easy why it is there. And then, you know, if, there was, if that was a random graph, that's it. And if there were groups, you know, if that graph was created with the stochastic block model, then on the real axis you will have some Q minus one more eigenvalues with positions that are related to the, that are just the average degree times eigenvalues of this little Q by Q matrix that I already showed twice in the talk uh, by now. So, okay, so why exactly that? You would have to think about it. But it's really, really simple and now if I, and okay, so, so this is something that, that we computed, but now this, these properties that's a f for the graphs generated by the stochastic block model, that's fully rigorous. And in this paper, there are beautiful results about the spectral properties and this, you know, the, you know they're suggesting basically that, this, that the spectra of this matrix could be the analog of Ramanujan property for sparse graphs and, and non -regular, sparse non-regular graphs and things like that. So this is a really nice paper mathematically. And here I'm just comparing, this is the same graph, this is the histogram of the spectrum of the adjacency matrix, and here is nothing going out that you could say is the informative eigenvalue, whereas here the informative eigenvalue is clearly, you know, it's real and it's clearly out of the circle and there is nothing else close by with which you could confuse it. So this is our spectral redemption thing. And here you have a little picture where I took five groups and so I will run it again, I will describe what it is. So this is just the you know, piece of the spectra. At the beginning, I just took four, five separated groups, and then I was just t taking edge inside the groups and putting them in between. And I was doing that edge by edge, and I don't remember how many edges I replot, uh, I replot my spectrum. So I'm like a smoothly making the graph you know, harder and harder for the inference problem, and you see what is, what is happening with the spectrum here. So at the beginning, these five guys there are, well, this is a small graph, so they are not exactly degenerate. In the limit of large size, they would be degenerate because these are just five disconnected pieces. And then as I'm connecting the pieces, they are going towards the circle. And as I approach the phase transition, they jump into the circle and I don't see them anymore and here I can't detect anything anymore. So here I cross the detectability phase transition. And I see that I should be finishing. So here just to say that, you know, even on real graphs, quantitatively the spectra look the, as I described. So these are not at all graphs generated by the stochastic block model. But you somehow see there is the largest one and square root of the largest one, you draw a circle and it looks like the complex ones are inside and 
you know, things are clearly either outside or inside the circle and that would be telling you the number of groups. And when I was telling you about learning parameters, I didn't tell you how to learn the number of groups. So this is how you decide the number of groups in your network. Um, I, I will skip this. And this is just a slide to say, you know, we suggested this method now maybe two years ago. And before it was like this tool and proofs and algorithmically nothing. And this is some algorithmic works that we did using this matrix since. So you can use it also for you know, matrix completion, estimation in sparse hypergraphs, which is related to planted random CSP at tensor factorization in planted Isaac model, which is called sensor block model in some information theory literature. You can use it to calculate thresholds of percolation, epidemic spreading, all this on these very sparse graphs and you're getting sharper and better results than from the traditional spectral methods. So that's just, if you're interested in any of those, ask me. And that's my last slide. So you know, to summarize, what, what did I tell you? I told you about the bias optimal inference in the stochastic block model, about the belief propagation being a really nice analysis tool, and about you know, analyzing properly what is possible algorithmically, statistically, in a very simple model, how it helps you. You know, we had this linearization of the belief propagation and when we looked at it as an, as an algorithm, it occurred to us that this is a really nice spectral algorithm that could be used for other problems where maybe we don't have this nice motivation, but when it is working, nevertheless, uh, empirically as well. So that's all, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so singular values are, they are easy to analyze and there is not, uh, not any information in them about the, the clustering. So, yeah, I don't remember now what they are, but yeah, it's easy to figure out what they are actually. So there's no production like that? No, no, it's, uh, it's not at all.